going to start off by saying that you can kill a snake with just about any gun. However, it's very clear that some guns, specifically ones loaded with shot shells of some kind, are much better suited for snake defense. Shot shells are almost always necessary because it's very difficult to hit an angry snake in its small brain with a single projectile before it bites you. I want to talk about the pros and cons of using CCI shot shells in a handgun that you already have. For those of you who don't know, these are specialty handgun rounds available in different calibers. They have a small amount of birdshot where a standard bullet would be, and are typically used on venomous snakes. Federal also makes 22 shot shells that are noticeably cheaper than the CCI ones. The main selling point of shot shells is that they are much less expensive than buying a new firearm specifically for a snake defense. These rounds can be definitely effective on snakes provided you are close enough. Your effective range will heavily depend on the density of the pattern you are getting and on the caliber of your handgun. In general, we are talking about having a very good chance of killing the snake with the first shot from a distance of a few feet to a few yards. The further away you are from the snake, the more the snake shot will spread out and lose velocity, which reduces effectiveness. If you're working in a barn or shed where there might be snakes, it would be wise to bring a 22 loaded with shot shells. The reason for this is that if the snake is about to bite you, you probably don't have time to put hearing protection on. If you don't have hearing protection on, and you are in an enclosed space, the sound of the gunshot will be extremely loud. 22s are much quieter than other calibers, so they are much more suited for snake defense in enclosed spaces. You could use any 22 gun you already have, or if you want to get a 22 specifically for snake defense, I'd recommend the Henry Garden gun because it has no rifling. The smooth barrel results in a significantly better and tighter shot pattern than any rifled barrel could achieve. It's more or less commonly known that CCI shot shells can be unreliable in semi-auto handguns, and it has been my experience that with 9mm rounds, most of the time they'll cycle, but malfunctions are inevitable. However, it's not just semi-autos that have problems. On CCI's website, they have a disclaimer about how recoil can cause the shot capsule to move forward and jam the cylinder of the revolver. In fact, here are some YouTube comments where people complain about this very problem. To best minimize this problem, you'd want to have a larger and heavier revolver or a revolver chambered in a low recoiling cartridge like 22. You could also use a handgun that you already have and reload your own handgun shot shells if you have the tools and experience to do so. There are various videos on YouTube that demonstrate how to do this if you are interested. Personally, I think more people would be interested in a handgun that allows them to use readily available ammunition. Revolvers like the Taurus Judge or the Smith & Wesson Governor allow you to use 45 Colt and 410 shot shells that are found at many stores. 45 Colt is nice, but it's the 410 rounds, specifically birdshot, that we are interested in. The Governor has 6 rounds of capacity and can use 45 Colt, 45 ACP, and 2.5 inch 410 rounds. Many of the judges have a 5 round capacity and can use either 45 Colt or 3 inch 410 rounds. I could go into more depth about all the different models of judges that are available, but that's not really important right now. What is important is that with a governor or judge, you can have a reliable double action revolver that uses readily available 410 rounds and has a good capacity of 5 or 6. Regardless of shell length, the 410 rounds hold much more birdshot than the CCI shot shells do. This obviously equates to the 410 handguns having much more recoil than a regular handgun loaded with shot shells. When we compare regular handguns to a Taurus Judge, for example, the immediate question that comes to mind is how much of an advantage do 410 shells really give? Paul Harrell compared 410 birdshot to 45 ACP shot shells in his original Taurus Judge video. At 7 feet, the 410 put noticeably more pellets on the target than the 45, but the difference wasn't exactly enormous. He also tried 38 special shot shells, and he said that they performed poorly. 
This is somewhat surprising to me because I've seen other people on YouTube test these same rounds and have better results. So what kind of handgun you're using them in seems to have a great deal of influence on the results. I'm briefly going to mention double barrel Derringer style 410-45 Colt handguns. First of all, I'm going to say that I don't think they're very good for snake defense. The fact that you have to take off the safety and cock the hammer before you fire puts you at a noticeable disadvantage. They are small, which is good for carrying, but very bad for dampening the 410's recoil. Also, two rounds might be enough, but if it's not, you'll likely be bit by the time you reload. It's also possible to use a double barrel 45 410 Peter Soli Howda pistol for snake defense. They are a little on the large side, and they have two rifled 10 inch barrels. However, the fact that they are easily three times the cost of a Taurus judge makes this an impractical choice for most people. You could choose to ditch the handgun idea and carry a pistol grip only shotgun. If you choose a Mossberg Shockwave for example, it has a longer barrel and 5 plus 1 capacity. So it's more effective than a judge and has better patterning due to a longer, smooth bore barrel. However, it might be somewhat cumbersome to carry considering how large it is compared to regular handguns. It is possible that you could devise some sort of drop leg holster to hold it if you wanted to. If this holster idea isn't very appealing, you could just carry it in your hands or on a sling. If I knew I was going into a particularly snake infested area, I would keep a full size shotgun in my hands. Just like in bear country, you need to have your weapon immediately accessible. Now, I'd like to talk about gun writer Alan Garber's search for the perfect snake gun. Just to be clear, he'll be talking about the best gun for hunting snakes, not snake defense. In my opinion, these things are two sides of the same coin as they both accomplish the same goal of killing a snake. Allen started out with a 357 revolver, but decided to sell it to buy a Ruger 1022. The reason for this decision is that 22 shot shells cost much less than 357 Magnum ones. However, he disliked the weight and size of a rifle in comparison to a handgun. Worse yet, the shot shells failed to reliably cycle, which meant that you needed both hands to operate the rifle. The only redeeming factor was that the long barrel gave better accuracy for headshots. When his wife gave him a Ruger Mark II, a semi-auto 22 handgun, he began using that instead. It was convenient to carry, but it still had the same problem that shot shells would not cycle the action. Next, he decided to use a Colt Frontier Scout revolver chambered in 22. The reason for this decision was twofold. It was more reliable than a semi-auto, and he was nostalgic for the Wild West. However, he stopped using this coal after he needed all six of its rounds to kill a snake that was particularly good at avoiding his shots. Because of this, he switched back to his Ruger Mark II handgun. He then started searching for a higher capacity 22 revolver and settled upon an Uberti 1873 Cattleman with a 7.5 inch barrel and a 12 shot capacity. Allen says that this gun is almost perfect, but a truly perfect snake gun would be made out of stainless steel. It's my opinion that the best snake guns are either 22 revolvers or small 410 shotguns. I would recommend a 410 Mossberg Shockwave if you require more range slash effectiveness, have both hands free to work the action, and you want something that uses readily available ammo. I would recommend a 22 revolver if you need something that's easier to carry, can be fired with one hand, and is easier on the ears. Cost of ammo also may be a concern for people. In general, CCI 22 shot shells are roughly comparable in price to 410 shot shells. The Federal 22 shot shells can be cheaper than both of those, and CCI shot shells in regular handgun calibers are the most expensive choice of the bunch. Now, I'm going to talk about what you should and shouldn't do if you get bit. If you get bit and you cannot kill the snake, try your best to immediately get away from the snake. It may bite you many more times if you don't. Once you've killed the snake or have gotten to a safe distance, take a picture or two of the snake with your phone. The knowledge of what snake bit you may help the doctors treat the bite. If you can't take a picture of it, try to remember what colors and pattern it has. 
Do not try to catch it. Next, remind yourself that you should not panic for two reasons. Because we have anti-venom, relatively few people die in the U.S. due to snake bites. Also, even if it was a venomous snake that bit you, it's possible that it was a dry bite, one that did not inject venom into you. Now, if you get bit, you want to get anti-venom as soon as possible. You also want to avoid panicking or exerting yourself with much movement, as this will increase your heart rate and cause the venom to spread faster through your body. What you should do next is remove any jewelry or tight-fitting clothes before your wound starts to swell. You should also elevate the wound to roughly the same level as your heart. If you can, clean the bite with soap and water and then bandage it. There are many things that could make your situation worse. This is why you should not do things like cutting the wound, using a tourniquet, or taking painkillers, alcohol, or caffeine. I want to take a moment to explicitly say that so-called venom extractors are not effective at treating snake bites. Scientists actually tested venom extractors on human volunteers who had been injected with a harmless radioactive solution. The venom extractor removed basically none of the mock venom solution. If you get bit while hiking by yourself and you have self-service, you should lie down in a relatively open area as you call 911. Obviously, you want to make sure that there are no snakes nearby before you lie down. It's very important that you remember exactly where you are and that you stay calm so you can give clear directions to the 911 dispatcher. Alternatively, if you have someone with you, it may be a good idea for them to go wait at the beginning of the trail so that they can guide the medics to you. This goes double if you are considerably far off the beaten path or if the trail is not clearly marked. The best scenario is if you have multiple people with you and they can carry you all the way to a vehicle. Carrying the victim is the best plan because it keeps their heart rate down and it's very likely that they'll be in no shape to walk much in the first place. To illustrate this point, there's a video on YouTube of a pastor who was having trouble just standing upright and breathing almost immediately after being bit by a rattlesnake. The worst case scenario is if you are by yourself in a remote area that has no cell reception at all. In this scenario, since no one knows that you need help, you will have to walk or crawl back to your vehicle. If you have to walk far or over rough terrain, your chances of survival are not good. This situation could be different though if you have a personal locator beacon, or PLB. This device gives the authorities your location and the fact that you need help. However, until they actually get to you, they won't know that you have been bitten by a snake and consequently may not bring anti-venom. If you have the foresight to bring a PLB, it can potentially save your life by giving you the option to sit tight and wait for help to come. Though you have to keep in mind, depending on where you are, it may take a while for help to arrive. To illustrate what I've been saying, I want to share Kyle's snake bite survival story with you. On a family hike in a remote part of Yosemite, Kyle, 33, was bit by a snake and almost immediately passed out. He did regain consciousness after about a minute or two later, and would be both bleeding from the bite as well as frequently vomiting throughout this whole encounter. There was no cell service, so his brother Garrett had to run roughly half a mile before he was able to call 911. The 911 dispatcher tried to order a helicopter, but there was none immediately available. Because of this, Garrett was asked to run two more miles to a nearby town to meet the medics that were arriving in a single ambulance. Garrett and the medics then traveled on foot to reach Kyle. This included crossing a bridge that was almost entirely washed out because of flooding. Only the steel girders of the bridge were left to cross on. Once the medics got to Kyle, they were not able to give him anti-venom that they would usually have because it had not been restocked. The medics then gave Kyle powerful medicine to numb the pain and carried him to an area where it would be possible to load him into a helicopter. Finally, a helicopter did arrive roughly three hours after Kyle was bit. Now, I'm going to talk about how you can avoid getting bit. One of the best things that you can do is pay attention to where you put your hands and feet. 
People tend to get bit when they step on a snake in tall grass or when they stick a hand in a place where they can't see and that they don't know a snake is hiding there. This is why we have cases like these where a man who was bitten on the hand by a rattlesnake that he did not see was under his lawnmower. We also have a case where a man was bitten on the ankle by a rattlesnake while he was looking for a golf ball in tall grass. One other thing, people have also been bitten when they are wading or swimming because snakes can swim too. If you have to walk in tall grass, you should use a long stick to tap the ground in front of you as you walk, because this will give snakes time to move away before you walk through. It would also be a good idea to wear snake-proof boots, long pants, and thick leather gloves. It's also important to keep your grass cut short and to eliminate any hiding spots in your yard specifically under large rocks, sidewalk stones, or farm machinery to prevent any snakes from hanging around. Snakes eat mice and other small critters. If you have cats, they'll keep the mouse population down and snakes won't have a reason to come around. Since cats are naturally very afraid of snakes, I would not worry about them getting bit. The smell of pet food or rodents can also attract snakes. So if you have pet food, put it in sealable containers if you have a rodent problem, you can get a handle on it with traps or a cat. Snakes will also try to eat your eggs if you have chickens, so make sure to have the chicken's coop sealed up tight. There are also some people that just don't have common sense, which is why many of those that have died from snake bites died precisely because they were holding venomous snakes. Some particularly religious types handle snakes during church services, and some people have captive venomous snakes kept in their houses. Both of these things are a recipe for disaster, and frankly, I'm surprised more people haven't died because of this sort of thing. Venomous snakes are very dangerous. Even if they are beheaded, the head can still be conscious and it can still bite you. This final section will be a bit of a tangent. There seems to be a certain mindset among some people that the snakes are so valuable to the environment that we should prioritize their lives over the safety of humans. Which is why I can immediately find incredibly irresponsible advice from the Army's own website telling regular people that if a snake is trapped indoors, they should try to capture the snake on their own to avoid hurting the snake. I don't know about you, but if I find a venomous snake in my house, the last thing on my mind is the welfare of the snake. However, I'm going to be as charitable as possible and mention that this article did also suggest the much more rational method of calling the professionals so that they can remove the snake. I perfectly understand the reasons why someone wouldn't want to kill a snake. If you see one while you're hiking, for example, and it's not near any pets, livestock, or people, all you really have to do is keep your distance. What I do not understand is the argument that you should not kill snakes because they are performing some sort of very unique role because they eat rodents that can spread disease. Coyotes, foxes, hawks, owls, bobcats, house cats all eat rodents. This argument makes about as much sense to me as the opposing argument that an acquaintance of mine has, being that you should shoot all the coyotes that you can because they are hard on the rodent population. Both of these views share a fixation on the rodent population and a similar belief that some creature, whether human or snake, is the sole solution to this alleged problem. If you think deeper about the idea that you need snakes to kill mice, you realize that farmers that want to keep the rodent population in control do not buy a bunch of snakes. Instead, they buy cats. Assuming you have a semi-feral cat that is only eating mice, it'll eat an average of 63 mice per week, 9 per day, while an adult milk snake will eat about 1 mouse per week. Thus, I have two final conclusions. Cats are statistically better than snakes, and that snakes of the two-legged variety are the worst kind.